great to see a busy crowd in here for our very distinguished 2023 Sundance London Industry Keynote Talk. Uh, we are so, so thrilled to have with us today Anthony Bregman. Do the applause, one applause. Not yet. No. That could be terrible. Just for being Anthony Bregman, you get the applause. <laughs> Um, I'm Wendy Mitchell, producer of Sundance London. I'm so, I, I don't know the one, mom, I told you, don't do that. Um, we're so thrilled to have this festival and to have all these amazing industry talks and for you, the industry bachelors, to be with us on this journey. And I hope you're going to enjoy this session and learn something and we're going to definitely leave plenty of time at the end for some of your questions, your comments. If you're a producer, you can come cry on Anthony's shoulder together, or high five, or whatever producers do together. Um, so for this talk, I love that we have a title for it, first of all, it's not just Anthony Bregman keynote. It's why film producing matters and nothing else does. Nothing. So we're really excited to, to hear why Anthony feels that way. Um, Anthony is the co-founder of New York's Likely Story. Over the past decades, he has produced hits such as Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Let's clap for that, come on. Uh, Foxcatcher in the Heights. At Sundance London here on Sunday, we are showing one of his latest productions, You Hurt My Feelings, directed by the absolute legend, Nicole Holofsena. Come see that on Sunday. I do think there's, for the second screening on Sunday, there might still be a few tickets even left. Not many. So get in there and get your tickets. Um, and also at Sundance Utah this year, he had not only You Hurt My Feelings, but he also had Flora and Son and Eileen. He's also worked in episodic like Living With Yourself on Netflix with Paul Rudd. Uh, we're so thrilled. Anthony was invited like before we basically had festival dates. We were just like, we've got to get Anthony this year. He's got three films in Utah. Um, this is his moment. So. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> Next year, yeah. nah, uh, not so much. Last year's business. Um, there's so much we're going to talk about. Uh, I guess, firstly, how would you say you've been producing for decades and you were in that sort of digital revolution? in New York in the 90s. Um, how would you say producing has changed or has it not really, the fundamentals? You know, I think producing has changed a lot from like, back when I started producing, we were shooting films on film, we were editing films on flatbed, we were distributing films like strictly in movie theaters, streaming didn't exist, TV series were terrible, you went into TV because you couldn't make it in film, um, and uh, um, and you know none of that exists now. We we used to be given uh, rolls of quarters to make phone calls with because cell phones were. Too That's expensive. a coin for our British guests. <laughs> it's like a, a twenty pence. Yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. And so, and, and and they were told, don't don't make phone calls on the cell phone. Don't charge the cell phone back because it's too expensive. Go to a phone booth and. Wow, you actually were calling people at a payphone on pay film phones. productions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on film productions as PAs. Okay. We want. I remember we had a cell phone on the ice storm that was. <laughs> um, it, it came in a briefcase, and you opened it up, and you put an <laughs> antenna on top, and that's what you used as the cell phone. And this was in ninety. Is that 96 oh. or something? 97? 97? Six or seven, something like that. So that in that way has changed. Some it, of the logistics and technology have changed. Yes, yeah. that has changed. All those things have changed. Now, obviously, series is arguably, you know, like the place that people go to first, and now we poach people from series to make films. You know, we 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 edit, we, we shoot on digital, you know, there's still some shooting on film. I don't think anybody edits, I think very few people edit on on uh, on film anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I heard that some directors do and they are told, oh well, the time it takes to cut film gives you time to think. And you have- Does Chris Nolan, he probably yeah. edits on- I don't know what he edits on, but he, but he shoots on film yeah. only. I think okay. he shoots on, on IMAX. Yeah. You know, Tarantino <laughs> shoots on, 
Super 35, and you know, hats off if you can afford it, God bless, go do it. But the idea that people are saying, well, if you don't shoot it on film, it's not a film. If you don't, if, it, if, a, if it's not a film, if it's not playing in a film theater, that is, you know, the ruling establishment talking down, afraid of what the future is. And that is the, you know, it's, it's like the equivalent of saying, well, if you can't, it's not really a car ride if you can't, you know, drive it in a Bentley. It's like, okay, if you can afford one, great, but, you know, what about the rest of, the rest of us? And, you know, I think we're getting around fine. Are you in a Mini Cooper? What are you doing? No. <laughs> I have subway token. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, but, and so in that sense, things have changed. In, 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 in another sense, I'll give you a few ways things have, have not changed. One, thing, one way things have not changed since I started in the business, where, where, and I started with a company called Good Machine in the 90s, which was part of, like the, you know, part of forming the indie movement. It was a company formed by Ted Hope and James Seamus, and it was, we had a tiny you know, office in West Chelsea um, where we shared the floor with the American Communist Party, um, was on the same floor. And, uh, um, and there was a, but, but you know, Communism aside, there was definitely a punk aesthetic where we felt that the system was there to serve our needs if they could, and if the system doesn't serve our needs, we will find a way around it. We and 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 we definitely had a kind of you know you know you know a, a rebellious attitude towards how you make films in that tiny West Chelsea office. Um, uh, um, we, we created the first film ever to edit on a nonlinear system, on the Avid, which had never been used for film before because they hadn't solved the frame drop, the frame rate issue. Um, and, uh, and we said that's going to be a cheaper way for us to shoot, and we did that. That film was Ang Lee's uh, The Wedding Banquet. Um, and that was the first film ever shot, ever, ever edited digitally. We shot another, we did another movie called Love God, Frank Rose Love God in 1995, which was a punk rock monster sex movie, which has the distinction of being the first film ever shot on digital video. And now, you know, 95% of films are shot on and digital. And people were upset though. And people were upset. That you yeah. were shooting on digital. I know, what are you doing? I remember yeah. going with that film to the Thessaloniki Film Festival and talking about the future of film and being digital, um, and people would stand up in the back and saying, what you are talking about is the death of cinema. <laughs> you know, and, and, they were, and they meant it, and they were, and they were threatened by it. Yeah. And of course it didn't kill cinema. In fact, a lot of cinema would never have happened if it weren't for taking those steps. And so it's always that, you know, you always have to look at the kind of ruling establishment as something to either serve you or for you to um, find a way to break it down. Um, and I think that happens over and over in the business. And, the, and so what I would say, the thing that hasn't changed is the sense of producer self-determinism. So a sense that the, it's up to the producer to find a way. You figure it out, that's what the producer's job is, is to find a way to make it happen for this movie, at this budget, with this filmmaker's vision, with the resources that you have, and with the rest of the ingenuity that you can put together. Find a way. <laughs> the mantra. Yeah. Uh, find the way. Um, let's talk a little bit about what Likely Story is up to, because you, I find it fascinating that you're still keeping with those sort of auteur indie roots, but you're also making some bigger commercial projects. I mean, In the Heights is not a little, yeah. you know, relationship drama in a, in a room. Um, did, who saw the In the Heights? All singing, all dancing. That pool scene. I don't, I, yeah, I don't, can't even imagine having to pull that I'll, off. I'll tell you something about the pool scene. Yeah. It was the most <laughs> expensive day of shooting I've ever had. We had 750, not 750 extras. We had 750 actors because they're all dancers, so you have to pay them like $2,000 a day. So we had 750 actors on on that day, and we um, and it was the most expensive. We had cranes. We had, like, it was a massive thing, and then we got rained out. <laughs> so oh, we ouch. ended up not shooting um, with 750 dancers huddled with us in this little pool room, this pool shed thing, and uh, um, and then we had to repeat it the next day. So it was twice the most expensive day. <laughs> I, this is why I would cannot get even fathom being a producer because there's too much to handle. But I bring up In the Heights as an example of, you know, bigger scale commercial films. You're doing 
the really cool indie You Hurt My Feelings. And you're also doing episodic. So, so how, why do you want to do all three? Is that genuine passion that you want to pay the 700 dancers and make that Busby Berkeley of today? And you want to tell the small stories and you want to do episodic? Or is this just the way to make financial sense, to make a sustainable company? You need to do all three. Right. Oh, I, it, it's, okay, so there's a complex answer to that because it is everything. It's all the above. I'd say number one is I have a company that's small enough that we don't have to do anything. So we're never, we've ne we're never in the position where we say we have to find, you know, fill this pipeline so we're going to do, you know, um, uh, you know. Our fourth quarter, we need three yeah, more. exactly. We yeah. don't have that really. Yeah. Um, uh, however, um, um, it, it, well, well, as and as a result of that, we only ever do films that are exciting to us, and they're exciting to us for a number of reasons. One is creatively exciting. It seems like a, it'll be a cool movie, a movie that we want to see, a movie that we think that has an audience, a movie where we think the the ambitions of the filmmaker and the script match with what we can get for it. So we're not going to be living in in a contradiction of of resources, and uh, and it's something that we can you know take so long and so much out of you to make a movie that you have to love it you have to really believe in it um, and so we, we, we you know whether that movie presents itself as like a smaller indie specialized movie or a bigger movie like in the Heights or some of the other bigger movies that we've done the you know or a series those are as kind of incidental what that is it's just a different type of production um, and and we find and we and we want to find the right way to make each movie, and that and and that will present itself with all the particulars of the movie. And so, you know, if the filmmakers that we're working with, and we have a lot of long-standing relationships with filmmakers, um, if they're moving into those places, we're going to move with them into those places. And we're um, and and so and it doesn't matter, you know. What, what, what the format is, it doesn't matter. Is it streaming, is it theatrical, is it studio, is it independent, is it a series, is it a feature? All those things are in, in some way side notes to the question of is this someone we want to work with, is someone we believe in, and is this a story that we want to make? And those are the big, those are the big issues. Um, and we have, you know, you know Nicole's film, yeah. Um, is the seventh film I've made with Nicole. I've worked. I've I've had like a longer and you know incredibly satisfying creative relationship with her for uh, almost thirty years um, now. You know since her first film. And whatever she'll do, I will do. You know if if she wants me to do it. As long as she wants me to do it, I'm going to do that. Um, and uh, and you know the same with John Carney. And we have. You know these these relationships that go on, and 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 each time one of these filmmakers comes up with an idea for a film or a script, it's 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 our new puzzle to figure out how to make that work, and that's what our job is as producer, and that's why these relationships exist. Now, uh, the the complexity of that is that it's also not is it, it, so so that's why we do these movies. There's a kind of a, a greater kind of financial reason why we are doing these movies in all these different ways is because the the you know film making and film producing is an ecosystem, and we are part of it. And the the you know the the um, uh, uh, the bigger movies are financing our smaller movies. You know, if you look at a sales agent, the sales agent will always tell you, yeah, we'll we'll, you know, we'll take this movie that no one really, you know, believes in yet because you haven't we haven't sold it yet and we'll jam it down their throats because we're going to we're going to pair it with like a with bigger the big movie. One. That um, do and, and I think yeah. the stars do that same calculation. Jim Carrey does Eternal Sunshine, you know, and we and J Jim Carrey's participation in Eternal Sunshine gave us that movie's reality. That movie happened because he came. But on the other hand, he had just done Bruce Almighty. He was the biggest star in the world, and he saw this as something that he was going to one for me, one for them. Exactly. Yeah. And I think we have that in a in in a different way with producers. In that, you know, when we put You Hurt My Feelings together. Nobody was. Nobody wanted to make it. Uh, Film Nation was on board to to sell it. A24 came in to distribute the U.S. rights. No one came in to finance it, um, and we were stuck for a long time. And the and the the way that we were able to finance it was we had received 
you know, money for our bigger films that we were making with Warner Brothers and with Netflix. And in the end, I was able to say, well, we're going to put our own money into it. And that's, and so in a way, those bigger films finance this small film that's playing here as a closing night, you know, and then eventually, thank God, it proved to be, thank God, because my wife won't divorce me over this, is that it proved to be something that, you know, that, that made its money back. Yeah. And we're able to, you know, but, but if, we, if we hadn't done those bigger movies, we wouldn't have been able, this movie wouldn't exist. Yeah. You said a really cool phrase to me earlier, which is that you feel like you have an obligation to stay in business as a, as a film producer. Can you just talk a little bit about that sentiment? Is that, a, who, who's the obligation to? I, I, think, they, I think producers have, you know, have an obligation to stay in business because if you don't have producers, we're not gonna have films. You're not gonna have people, you know, you know first of all, if you're a producer and, and there's no version of you staying in business, you won't be here. And you know who else won't be here? The directors that you found ways to make these movies for, and the writers who, who, are, you know, who, who are able to see their scripts realized because you paired them with a director, or you and, the, you, you and the director that they paired themselves with, you found the money for it, or you were able to make that money work, or you were able to find the, you know, the location to shoot it in, and the way to, to you know, and the way to to kind of find your way out of the millions and millions of problems that you have, um, that, 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 that every film has. And if you're a producer, you, you know exactly what I mean. It's like every day you're dealing with problem after problem after problem, and you're having to use every part of your brain, whether it's your, you know, your quantitative side, you're using mathematics, you're using diplomacy, you're using philosophy, you're using ethics, you're using your taste in music, you're using your ability to use and manipulate numbers, you're using your ability to use and manipulate people. To, to <laughs> you, 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 you have to use every part of your head to make that thing work. That's what a producer does. And the producer is the only person on a film um, whose job doesn't end. There's no end of that job description. It's just sometimes why it's difficult for people to say, well, what exactly does a producer do? Which, which nobody says, what exactly does a DP do? Because it's very clear, the DP shoots the movie, but the DP doesn't have anything to do with the a, a composer's contract. The DP doesn't go into Teamster negotiations. The DP doesn't have to deal with the, uh, with the lawyer of the actor who's trying to kill the deal. You know, the DP doesn't, and, and, and you know what? Who else doesn't have to do those things? The director, who is the because center you're doing of the it. movie, <laughs> yeah. doesn't have to do those things yeah. because that's what the producer does. So the, the producer is, is, is a necessary part of this process. The partner to both the creative aspects of the movie, the financial aspects of the movie, who's the one responsible for, you know, making sure that no one gets killed on set, to make sure that no one gets sued, to make sure that all the IP acquisition is in order, to make sure that, you, that to the investors that you're exploiting the IP in the right way. All these things fall on the producer, and if any one of these things don't work, the film fails and the producer fails. And I often say, pretentiously, that that a film is that a, that a, a film is like a space shuttle, and in a space shuttle you have a million connections, a million electrical connections, and all it takes is one of those connections to spark out, and then it starts a fire, and the whole space shuttle goes down. And you and 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 if you as the as the head of that project, the producer of the space shuttle, say, you know, I got all the other connections right. Nobody gives a shit. The, the space <laughs> shuttle came down. You know, you failed. And that's what it is with a movie, is that, it, and, and, and before you say, well, uh, the space shuttle is more complicated than a movie, I'll tell you this. The space shuttle is science and math, and there's a right and wrong answer to every question there. And if you, and if you trace that, that sparked out connection back, you'll say, oh, I didn't carry the zero, or I didn't you know, do something else, and there was a wrong answer. In a film, there's no right or wrong answers. You're feeling your way through it. What's the wrong music cue? What's the wrong line of dialogue? What's the wrong angle? Your response, if, if one of those things goes wrong, and it kind of shifts people onto the negative side of the movie, and it gets bad reviews, and it doesn't perform at the box office, and the whole, thing's, and the whole thing comes down because of it, you're to blame because you're the producer and they will look at you in that way. The money people will look at you that way. Even the director will look at you in that way. So I, uh, yeah, I always knew that film producers were smarter than rocket scientists. <laughs> and now we know why, because it is a thousand things. 
And yeah, I didn't say smarter. It, I, I just mean better. I said better, better, better than rocket scientists. <laughs> Different kind of smart. Yeah. Because yeah, it's it's. Um, there was another phrase. I'm quoting back at you, like some sort of fan girl. You also said this phrase. Um, as a producer, you're both a fan of the film and a participant. Yeah. In getting that film out, I mean, how much of a I'm guessing just you're quite a passionate guy, as we're hearing. I can't imagine that you are doing a job because you needed to fill six months. Like, you have to be passionate about the vision. Yeah, I think you do it because you're a fan. And the thing that's the most thrilling part of this business for me is that you get to be a participant in the thing that you're a fan of, which yeah. is it's very rare. You know, you go, you know, you know, Bruce Springsteen was here last night, as some of you may have noticed. So, so Bruce, but you were you, at our party. I was at the you party. You did not go to Bruce. Exactly. Yeah. But you, you could be a fan of Bruce Springsteen. You can't be a participant in it. You can think you're a participant <laughs> because you know the words and you dance along with it and you sing along with it. But the, but the real, but the reality is you're not a participant of it. And here, I fall in love with directors. I fall in love with stories. I fall in love with actors. And and then I get to work with them day to day, yeah. working out problems with them, finding ways to deliver on the unreasonable things that they want or the reasonable things that they want, and, and working with them in the successes and agonizing over the things that don't work out and making those little decisions along the way that can make it work out better. Um, and that's the, and so going back to your other question, which I didn't answer, the, the, um, uh, you, I think a producer has an obligation to stay in business. Okay. If the producer's not doing these things and they're not going to get done, the ecosystem fails. You know, the like for every producer who says, you know what, it's just too difficult, um, and I know producers like this, or it's just too absorbing, I can't take the pain of things not working out anymore, and I'm going to go sell real estate. That is, how many movies will that producer not make that could have been made, that could be playing here, that could be playing your theaters, that could be creating careers, that could be creating the, the like, culture that we're, that we're all part of. So a producer abandoning producing or, uh, is, 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 a, is a blow to filmmaking in general and to the whole filmmaking ecosystem and so it's the producer's obligation to find a way to stay in business and i guess this answers the other question you asked me before which is like why are you doing all these different things <laughs> because we have to stay in business yeah. too we yeah. all have to find a way to make it we're miners and we have to find go and dig where the gold is and find and if it's not in this mine, we're going to try that. And if it's not yeah. there, we're going to try there. And you have to find a way to make it happen because you have to stay in business, and you have to stay in business because there are movies that you're going to make that need to be made and that won't be made if you're not in business. Who here in the room is a producer or part of your job as a producer? Okay, a lot of people. I hope you feel seen <laughs> right now. The pain of your life has just been articulated by this man. Um, but the importance of your job has also been articulated because if, if you go out of business and Nicole can't find somebody to get the money for you hurt my feelings, that would mean in five years we're showing Love is Blind season 82 at the closing of Sundance London. And I probably will be watching that trash. But <laughs> yeah, it, it trickles down, like you said, to the culture, to the audience, to the world needs yeah. films, and therefore that's why film producing matters and nothing else does. Yes. Um, I brought it back around. Uh, well done. Thanks. <laughs> with, uh, you have been working a bit with the streamers. I'm just curious sort of how you see the landscape or even just personal, do you enjoy working with the streamers? I mean, you get an audience guaranteed, right? Yeah, I, I so, uh, you know, we've done, we were the first company, again, people saying the death of cinema, we were the first company to have a uh, overall deal with Netflix, and we and which which we did, and we made movies with Nicole Hallstein, we made Land of Steady Habits, we made Private Life with uh, Tamara Jenkins, we made I'm Thinking of Any Things with Charlie Kaufman, we made um, real uh, tours going all, into that all world. All tours, yeah, and 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 Alice Wu's the half of it. Uh, Jennifer Caden Robinson's some, uh, Someone Great, and then Do Revenge, and these are all films that 
that, that we were not able to make with the traditional studio partners that we, uh, the traditional independent partners that we worked with. In fact, Tamara Jenkins' movie, Private Life, and Nicole's movie, uh, The Land of Steady Habits, were both in development at other studios that couldn't make them. And then they basically gave them up. And we turned to Netflix and said, would you make them? They said, yeah, these, we'd love to make those. And that's when we said, OK, this is now, this is now a viable thing. This was in 2016. And uh, um, I don't think Netflix would do that deal today. Well, or I think Netflix they? is making something different now. Okay. And they've moved on, and culture moves on, and and you know their their directives move on, and that's fine. They have that right, and they're and they're you know they do well for themselves, and and now other things are coming up. I mean, you have you know I think there's theatrical is coming back to a great degree. Um, uh, you have incredible movies that like Focus and Searchlight and are making. You have um, uh, A24, we made You Hurt My Feelings with A24. Eileen is being distributed by Neon. Yeah. Um, uh, um, we're still working with streamers. Uh, Flora and Sun is being distributed by Apple. Um, uh, and we're still doing, you know, we, and we made Do Revenge with, uh, with, with Netflix and that, and, we, and those are the four movies we made like in 2022. And so those, and, and so, and so you have to, you know, the, you know, the whole closed mindset, open mindset thing, you have to keep an open mindset about, about what this business is and not be nostalgic about what it was because it moves quickly and you don't want to be left behind and you want to make sure that you're continuing to make these movies um, and that these movies are continuing to get made. And if that means shooting digitally in 1997, that's what that means. If that means making movies for streamers in 2017, that's what that means. You know, and, and what is it now in 2023? I mean, you know, the world is continuing to evolve and, and places like Netflix aren't really looking for that type of movie anymore. You know, luckily other people are. Optimism, I like that <laughs> optimism. I wanted to talk a, just one or two more questions about this sort of big picture landscape and then I want to hear stories about making Eternal Sunshine because I'm basic. Um, yeah, looking at, you know, where you see what the studios are doing and not doing and where you might see opportunities for independent voices like these amazing people to sort of come in and influence the culture in a way that the studios aren't. Um, big question. <laughs> so, um, um, which has a complicated answer, which I will get, and potentially a controversial answer. I think one thing is that we can all agree that right now the specialized business is under an enormous amount of stress. And it's very difficult to f understand what makes a film work and what makes a film not work in the independent sphere. There are a lot of films that are masterpieces that have come out that haven't done business. There are things that you know have done business, but not at the levels that they've done business that they would do that they would perform at like 10 years ago because the audiences for these films haven't come back out. Um, or they haven't come back out to see those movies. Or they've decided those movies are not theater movies. They're going to wait for them to come in stream on, on, on the streamers. Um, uh, and the, so the, and that is a problem. And the, there's, there's certain like specific answers to those problems. Like, you know, if you're making a drama, make it like, you know, at a budget like Past Lives, right? Which is, I don't know if anyone's, if everyone, oh, it hasn't come out here yet. It's, it's, no, here. it's, it's at the here festival. It's here starting, fucking today's Friday, movie. isn't it? It's, it's here, no, it's here, yeah. No, it's Saturday, it starts Saturday at 6 p.m. Fantastic It's movie. sold out, it is amazing. It's yeah. an amazing movie, and it did really well, and they made it for very little, so the, you know, I don't know, I, I, I didn't make it, but it was, uh, um, Pam might be in the room. Is she? Pam Coffer? Yeah, she is came she in. Here? Yeah, why not? Maybe uh, not in this room, but she's here today. Oh, I didn't know that. You can ask her how much money. Um, uh, I, I texted her. She's, okay. she's one of my dear friends, and I texted her like in the theater saying, oh, my God, this is incredible. Okay. Um, uh, um, and well, she she killed it on that. Yeah. Um, and uh, and 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 so like these mini, you know, like the the like the micro problems can get solved by trying to find a way to do something that feels like an original experience and isn't done at a budget that is uh, is uh, um, you know prohibitive, so that even if it you know makes whatever ten million dollars, that it will still lose money. 
you know, that's, so that's one, that's one thing. I think there's another kind of, you know, maybe more controversial way to look at the landscape right now, which is to look at what's happening in the studio world, which I find, you know, both, uh, um, you know, disturbing, anxiety producing, and very exciting, um, uh, which is, <laughs> which is that you can look over like the last, you know, few years and you can see so what so what have the studios been doing over like the last 10 years? Is they've been making billions and billions of dollars off of these franchises, these brand franchises. What are these brands? Marvel, DC, Pixar, Fast and Furious, Barbie. James Bond. <laughs> um, uh, well Barbie is different. It's, it's different because they haven't they, but Mattel. They, that's new. Yeah. But, um, you know, uh, uh, Harry Potter, all those movies, you know, have been making them, the, making the studios incredible amounts of money. And, you know, good for them because, because, like I said before, the ecosystem trickles down that money into, you know, the more interesting films. Um, and, uh, and what's been happening over the last, you know, couple of years is that every single one of those franchises, without exception, has been failing, right? Now, the, the profit charts have been like this, and the failures are just becoming apparent. I mean, you, if you read the trade presses, you'll see, hey, you know, Indiana Jones didn't make that much money. Hey, Guardians 3 made less than Guardians 2. Fast and Furious 10 made less, less than Fast and Furious 9, which made less than Fast and Furious 8. You know, they're still making, whatever, $500 million or something like that, so nobody's really worried about it. But, um, but, but at the same time that they've gone over that curve, over the peak, and are starting to come down, the budgets for those films, by necessity, have gone up, right? Because when you make a franchise, you have kickers in each of the actors' contracts, so they make more money in there. And if you have like a car doing like a double flip, you know, or driving out of the you know, 80th floor of a building, what do you do the next time? You have to send it into outer space. You have to shoot it underwater from a submarine. Like whatever those things are, you know, cost money, and so you, they, you need to always have a bigger bang than you had the last time. So those those budgets are going up. So you have these movies now that you used to make for like $100 million, and now they make for $300 million. And instead of making $700 million, they're now making $500 or $400 million. If you know studio economics, a $300 million movie that makes five or $600 million is losing $200 million, because that's the way the money trickles down there. And at the same time that these two things are happening, you ha I, I, I think like you say, well, is that trend going to continue, or is that trend going to correct itself? And I, I have to say, I go to those movies, and my kids used to go to those movies, and they don't anymore. You know, my, you know, my son, who was a super Marvel head, you know, I said to him a few weeks ago, why aren't, why aren't you seeing Guardians this weekend? And he was kind of shrugged his shoulders. My daughter, who's 13 years old, who spent six years only basically watching Jurassic Park movies. Um, uh, since she was like six <laughs> years old, it was yeah. very worrisome for a while. But then, uh, um, and, and she went, and, and you know, anytime I was you know, at home alone with her, I knew what we were doing is we were watching one of the Jurassic Park movies. Um, and uh, um, the, uh, she went to the last one, and she came out of it, and she said, you know, I think I'm done with it now. I'm done with dinosaurs. And the reason why she was done with it is because they were done with it. Because these things have run their course. They don't know what to do with them. They're not that interesting anymore. People are kind of reluctantly going because it's a brand. But they're not. But I don't. It's hard for me to see that curve going back up. Going back up. It's more easy for me to see that curve continuing. So what happens? Nothing happens here. People are. They're still making. You know, Guardians, which made less than the last Guardians, still made. Six hundred million dollars, or something like that. You know, so no one's going to be worried about that. But what happens when it goes here? What happens if that trend continues? And what happens with these three hundred million dollar films when they're now making three hundred million dollars? At what point do the studios say, "Wait a minute, we have a lot of people working here who need to sell movies to broad audiences, and those audiences um, uh, are diminishing with these films." You know, we we need the, we need stuff for those we need we need those films we need films that we can sell to those audiences. You know, they the studios themselves don't have a very deep well of development that is not attached to IP now. 
you know, they're, they're still, they're, they're now kind of attaching it to new IP. When I, when I say new IP, I mean, you know, IP that hasn't been used in 40 years like Top Gun or 15 years like Avatar or, you know, 30 years like Mario. All of those were hits. Or Barbie is probably going to be a hit. Um, uh, and, but, that, but that's not, that is IP, you know, because everyone knows Barbie, but it's not like that is one of the places where they place. It's not film IP, yes. Yeah, it's not, exactly. It's not film IP. So the, 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 so the studios aren't going to be able to access their deep well of non-branded development to create this. So I know this is all very abstract now, and it's like, you're like, why, why are we sitting here at Sundance talking about Fast and Furious? I'll tell you, is because, the, is because this is now the space that can be, because I don't believe that people are just ready, I just want to see IP stuff. I do think they want to see stuff that feels comfortable and familiar, and at the same, but at the same time, fresh. So I would call that not branded film, I would call that brand adjacent film. And what is an example of a brand adjacent film um, uh, that, that has succeeded lately? I'll tell you, Knives Out, right? What is Knives Out? It is an Agatha Christie movie that doesn't have Agatha Christie IP under it, but it still has a country manor with an old guy that like dies, butler. and everybody's a suspect, and there's twists and turns, and they 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 basically and they made it that way. They delivered on the pleasures of that type of movie, and they and and uh, um, and they marketed it that way. So they made, it was a it's a brand adjacent movie, and it's a great piece of art. Knives Out. What's another example? Everything Everywhere All at Once, you know, which won the Oscar this year and is a Matrix movie. It's a Matrix adjacent movie. It, it is, I, you know, who knows if the Daniels were thinking that. I, I don't, don't have access to the Daniels' minds. Um, but, the, but, but I do know that when I saw it advertised and then when I saw the movie, I was like, oh, this is like a, an updated, zeitgeisty, fun version of what The Matrix did, which was blow my mind with kind of, these get a parallel universes paired with incredible, fr incredibly fresh uh, action scenes. And that's what that delivered on. We, we kind of like started thinking this way when we made Do Revenge, which is a movie we made with Jennifer Kate and Robinson, which was we said we want to make, you know, we weren't thinking in this kind of more comprehensive way. We we're just thinking what happened to those, to the teen movies that we grew up on that we really liked. Um, which were dangerous, you know, not like Kissing Booth and not like, like Heathers or something. Yeah, Heathers, Heathers. Okay. Um, uh, Cruel Intentions, <laughs> um, Ten Things I Hate About You, Mean Girls, like those films that felt like it didn't feel safe for an 11 year old, it felt unsafe for a 16 year old. Yeah. Because they had sex in them, they had some drugs in them, they had, you know, complicated concepts. It felt like it was pushing, pushing things in a direction that didn't feel safe. Let's make that movie. And we studied those movies, and we made that movie, and it was something, and, and it was on Netflix, which, you know, has, does a great job of making the Kissing Booth type movies, but people came out, it performed like a $100 million movie, even though we made it for, you know, less than a fifth of that. And, 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 and that's because it was something that felt both comfortable, but also but fresh, fresh and new. So I think, and, and I look at the business, that that studios used to be in and used to do really well that they've somewhat abandoned for for the for the you know the, the fast temples, for the so. temples. but and and what are those movies you know like what's like die hard or speed which is you can say i'm not saying make a sequel to die hard or speed i'm saying make another single location every man action you know movie that has like wry comedy in it you know, or uh, where's, where's like the monster, you know, the sci-fi monster movies, like Aliens or Predator? Where's Back to the Future, one of like the formative films that, of, of my childhood, the, 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 uh, the, the high concept sci-fi comedy? You know, so the, you, you know, and, and you can go on and on. About can you bring these. up Indiana Jones? Because you, Indiana you Jones, told me this and, and the, I didn't know. Yeah, the globetrotting. The globetrotting epic adventure Indiana Jones, like every single one of these other movies that I mentioned, were not based on IP. They were all original ideas. Just an original idea somebody had in a room. Yeah, and then and then the and and those those ideas spawn their own IP, and then you know, 25 years later, Indiana Jones Five comes out, and everyone's like, oh. 
it doesn't work anymore. It's like, yes, yeah, because it's 25 years old. Um, and, uh, but, but, the, but the Raiders of the Lost Ark was, was, was one of the formative movies of my youth, you know, and, I, and one of the movies that made me feel that I could make movies, that there's something that I could connect to in those movies. And those movies have been abandoned, so, and, and the studios are making them. They're not developing them now. It's up to, and, and, and the way to make them is not through studio writers, not through the usual writers. It's through the Daniels, you know, and through Ryan Johnson, and through the filmmakers that we work with. The filmmakers that, that, that show here should be making that type of movie and paired with producers who can have that kind of vision and can bring, and can bring a big, wide-scale movie to a studio and say, look, this isn't a $500 million you know, box office movie, but this movie breaks even at $100 million, and it can go for everyone. So, that, so, so if you guys make this movie for $20 million or $30 million, this will, this will employ all those people who are going to be scratching their head about how to make Fast and Furious 18 work. Um, and, 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 and this is a better bet than that. So that's my answer to the specialized film problem. Yeah. I feel like we're in church, <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> Uh, let's, I did want to ask um, a couple of questions about how you work with talent. Um, and one I want to bring up is at Sundance US, um, you premiered Eileen, by, directed by William Oldroyd. I shouldn't just say by, because that, it's a collaborative effort, isn't it? Um, and some of you know Will Oldroyd uh, directed Lady Macbeth as his first feature. And I have to say, we wish Will was here. He couldn't be here this weekend, but he told me that he only got to know to make Lady Macbeth because he was at Sundance London about nine years ago or something, and Tristan Gallagher was on a panel talking about a low-budget scheme, eye features, and that's how Lady Macbeth got made. So, yeah, pay attention. You never know what's going to happen at Sundance London. We'll take credit for Lady Macbeth. How did, um, actually, before we talk about it, we have a clip from Eileen. So I wonder if our friends in the projection booth could play the Eileen clip, please. So I think they just announced- I, I should have set it up. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> like, what the hell is this movie? Um, I, well, I, first of all, I think they just dated it in the UK in December, early December release, maybe? Uh, that's this what week? it is in the US. I okay. haven't heard about the UK, I, but if that's what it is, that's great. It's the same, says Claire Benz. Thanks, um, Claire. So yeah, tell us a little bit about Eileen and how you found Will and how he was the right so, so, um, so first a little bit. So Eileen is, <laughs> is, is, is uh, based on this book, book by Otessa Moshfag, who writes these novels about, um, you know, messy uh, uh, women, you know, and, and kind of is, is like a, like it, she has a cult following in the U.S. and is, uh, you know, it has like these, these very unapologetic movies. And this is about Eileen is played by, Thomas and Mackenzie, she works in a boys' prison as like a secretary, um, and she falls under the sway of the Anne Hathaway character, who is, uh, um, uh, who's a, who's a, a new uh, psychologist, who's, uh, who's uh, very, uh, you know, this, this prison is in coastal Massachusetts. It's kind of a, like a shit life that, she that Thomason's character leads, that Eileen leads. And then she kind of sees this new person. And then she, they kind of wrestle each other into like a horrible crime. Um, and, uh, and this kind of happens towards the beginning of the movie. Um, uh, this is Christmas in prison. <laughs> um, and, and you know, Will, you know, Will's a great um, theater director. Um, uh, but the reason why, so, so I didn't bring Will to the project. Will brought me to the project. Fantastic. And basically the, the. How did Will find so you? So Will, like, like what I found, you know, I met Will after he'd made Lady Macbeth. And I saw Lady Macbeth and I tracked down who his agent was and I said, can I meet him? And I met with him and I was, you know, I was, like, I, you know, I loved that movie. I thought it was so inventive, so well done. You know, let me know. Well, you know, I'll think of things, and he wasn't, he was like, a, you know, attached to different projects yeah. in different places. I said, if there's anything that you ever need, you know, like, you know, help on setting up, let me know. Um, and that was, like, when was Lady Macbeth? Like, 2016 or something? 
Are we thinking uh, 20, 2016? Something like that. Oh, so right. I met with him right when that came out in the US, so 2016 or 2017. And, and I said, like, let's find something to do together. Um, we may have sent him some things that he didn't, that, was, that weren't right for him. And, but then in 2020, um, uh, um, he, he, he uh, came to me through his agent, uh, WME, um, and, uh, and, you know, said, like, you know, all these movies that I've been attached to, none of them are happening for one reason or another. They're kind of caught in the studio development system. And, uh, but, you this? know, this is, this is a, and this is a project that was also in the studio development with, with somebody else that, uh, you know, someone else had written a script, I think, for Scott Rudin. It was set up, I think, at Searchlight. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, it never happened. And, uh, um, and so Otessa, um, uh, who wrote the book, said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a stab at the script. And she and her husband, Luke, who's a screenwriter, wrote the script together. They brought it to Will. Will then brought it to me. And I, was, I kind of said, oh, I've been, you know, I'm dying to do something with, with Will. And here's something that we can work on together. We put it together fairly quickly, um, uh, sent, it, you know, sent it to a few actors for... Um, uh, for we thought we were going to do the Eileen role first, and everyone wanted to play the Eileen role. Everyone was ready to you know tape themselves for it, and we got like a hundred tapes. And I got a call from a manager, a friend of mine who represents Annie Hathaway, and she said, "I don't care about that role, but Annie, I think would Need like play. this role, yeah. you know. And what do you think?" And then we put it together like that yeah. at that moment, and then you know we cast Thomason. We shot it in uh, in uh, New Jersey. Um, it takes place in 1964, um, and uh, uh, brought it to Sundance. Yeah. It's absolutely, I just adore this film. I think, yeah. I mean, I loved Lady Macbeth so much, and this, I think, is a big leap, even from that, for, for yeah, Will it, as a it filmmaker. Is, it is an oddball movie that works, <laughs> and it's, yeah. which is kind of lightning in a bottle in that way. Uh, like, the thing that I remember, people coming out of the movie in, at Sundance saying, like, not everyone understood what happened. Everyone was saying like, "What happened to me when I yeah, watched that exactly. movie?" I didn't. What? It's not what, confusing. What's going on? It's not but confusing. It's but it's goes really, to unexpected places. Yeah, and it accesses these weird moments. Yeah. You're laughing, and then you're horrified at yourself, and laughing again. It's a. It's a. Um, Mark your diary. That's not an advertisement for the movie. Exactly. Claire Benz will sell you a ticket for December right now. Okay. <laughs> um. I have a load more questions. I'm gonna ask one more and then open to the audience, but I'm gonna ask one I know the audience wants to know. You mentioned lightning in a bottle, eternal sunshine. <laughs> I mean, because when it first came out, I don't think every, I, I remember Screen International famously, we gave it kind of lukewarm review. Oh, the guy yeah. just didn't get it. Um, yeah, what, what did well, that experience of making that film teach you, or what can you reflect on about Eternal Sunshine? I think you know, Eternal Sunshine was one of it was was it was it. I mean, it's kind of the plight of the producer is that you know a movie comes out and and when Eternal Sunshine comes out, we all thought, oh, we blew it. You know, we thought we made a, a huge culture changing movie. It came out like number seven of that weekend. Even though it was on like fifteen hundred screens, you know, behind the Focus released it. It was Focus that released it, um, and they did what they, I thought they did a great job. You know, they they we you know we loved the trailer. We thought you know, and it was just like I think people kind of thought like it's not going to be the Jim Carrey movie. It's not going to be another Bruce Almighty. It looks weird and arty. It's like you lit it in a different you know, and and that's what it, and and so it came out that way. We got. Very good reviews. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't a disaster, but it was like, you know, the movie made like $35 million in the U.S. and $75 million worldwide. It's a $20 million movie. But we were always measuring ourselves against Sideways that had come out at the same time that made 100 and something million dollars that got better reviews than we did. And we would go to every single awards ceremony and lose to Sideways. <laughs> That's what happened. I remember, because the producer side was a friend of mine, I would be back at the bar with him, and he's like, hey, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm here to watch you get the award. Uh, and they did. They got every single award. Uh, we got, like, you know, nominated for best uh, script at the Oscars, and Charlie won that. 
Um, and, but only because Sideways was in a different category. It was in the <laughs> adapted film, and we were in the original. And, uh, um, and Kate got uh, nominated but didn't win. Um, and it made a lot of the top 10 lists, but not the top of the top 10 lists. And, uh, um, and this was in 2004. And, the, and, and 2009, when everybody made, so it was nobody's best film of the year that year. But in 2009, when the film. So the decade. It, it was, it was it, so a Slate, I believe, put together a mother of all, everyone was doing their best of the decades list, and Slate put together a mother of all de uh, best of the decade list that kind of correlated all those, these reviewers' top you know, top of the decade list, and Eternal Sunshine was the number one film. You know, the I you know famously, I remember when when the uh, Los Angeles Film Critics Circle was making their um, uh, 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 was doing their vote. It was online. You could see the uh, as people voted, you could see that it would come in. As you, you could see the votes. You, you, you know, which film would win, and and uh, um, I was I, I was watching it happen, and I saw Eternal Sunshine come on. It was 2004, and I called Charlie, and I was like, G "Guess what? We just won the the Los Angeles Film Critics Circle," and then, almost as if in a Charlie Kaufman movie, <laughs> I saw the thing go blank, they and then Sideways out. came oh up on it. <laughs> And I was like, what the hell? That does sound like a script moment. It was. It, it was. It was, you know. Oh. And, uh, and, but, but then, you know, then six years later, it was the best of the decade. And Sideways, you, you know, which is a film I love. I don't want to throw shade <laughs> on it or anything, except that it showed throw, sh through shade on us for so long, um, <laughs> uh, was, uh, you know, was nowhere to be found. And it feels like, you, you know, your, your, um, your, you know, films get evaluated too soon. You know, what does, does you, you know what won best picture at the Oscars that year? Million Dollar Baby. You know, you know what, what poster is up in, in the hallways of like every film school? Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. So why, so, 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 you know, things get evaluated, not, sometimes the first weekend, that's it. Then you know, okay, the film worked, the film didn't work. You know, even months later when you have like the awards, the film is, you know, a winner or not, you know, and it's really, you know, the, the best picture Oscar, you know, should be given out 10 years after the fact when you can see the cultural impact where people sometimes things people have to catch up to that moment. Amazing. All right. We know, we know, Enough Ricardo. Crying for it, Eternal no. Sunshine. You don't drink Chardonnay either, do you? Um, it's time. This is your industry keynote. I see lots of good hands up. Whoever has a microphone, go to the nearest hand you see. <laughs> Thank you. In your role as uh, mystic rocket man, um, <laughs> magical dinosaur wrangler, um, what, do you, what do you dream of landing in your lap that's going to give you that tickly feeling in your tummy and think, I have to make this? Or what would you dream of getting to make? Yeah, dream project. Oh, that's tough. I mean, I, it, you know, I, I, I like a movie that works on all levels. I like a movie that can work with audiences, that works with critics, that works with awards, and that works at the box office. You know, Easy peasy. But, but, but yeah. I don't know that it's any particular type of movie because I'm not, you know, uh, you know, I've done horror films, I've done comedies, I've done romances, I've done rom-coms, and I've done, you know, action movies, I've done all sorts of movies, and I think anything that's, like, that feels exciting to me. I could tell you that's that, like, v very, very rarely, but, but I do look at a movie and I say, oh, that, you know, like, I looked at Coda, and I thought, I thought, that, that's my type of movie, and if I was at the top of my game, I wouldn't have been able to make a better movie than they made there, you know. And so, in that sense, I feel like uh, I was a little, you know, I, you know, I was never offered Coda. I never, you know, it was never an option. But I could look at that and say that's a movie that really works on every level. Parasite was a movie that that I I saw and I thought like, oh, you know, that that is that a movie that what do you, what more do you want from a movie than that, you know? And th that's the sort of thing. So just make Parasite, okay, easy peasy. Pitch him the new parasite. Go to the next hand you see. Maybe one on this side, <gasps> right up here. Hi there. I, I was Cosima, and I just wondered, 
what was the best movie and the worst movie you you worked on from a producer's point of view? Oh, I love and, it. And and why? Uh, what would you have done better? What would you have done better? <laughs> Which space shuttle imploded? You know. I love that question. Thank you. Um, boy, there's like no way of answering that question that won't get me in trouble. <laughs> Um, I, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think I have, I think it's, it's the, you know, the, I, I, well, I don't think I could say the best movie or the worst movie. You know, there's movies that, that I've made that have like given me incredible joy in the making of them. There's movies that have given me incredible joy in terms of how they turned out, you know, and there's dis decisions that I wish had gone differently, but I don't always like like for instance i could say that one of like the most joyful experiences for me was shooting in the heights you know it was john Chu's an amazing director both in terms of his you know the joy he brings to a movie and the joy he brings to the process of making a movie and the inclusion of it and it was incredible material and working with john and kiara who wrote the script and lin manuel miranda who wrote the music and you know were and you know it was just you couldn't ask for anything more. And then, you know, the movie didn't perform, you know, uh, and it didn't perform because it came out, you know, all simultaneously on HBO Max and in theaters, and it was during a pandemic and blah, 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 and all that. And you kind of said, well, it, it, you know, it had, maybe if I had pushed for it to not have come out then, we could have fought it and it could have come out like a year later, like Top Gun did, where people were coming back to theaters. Maybe that would have made a difference, maybe not. It's like, who, you know, I don't know what that, you know, but you could say that movie had a trajectory, you know, it had, it was an audience pleaser, like, you know, it had like the high, we tested it. Um, we had a test screening for it, and it had the highest scores that Warner Brothers ever had on a movie. And it was, you know, you know, and it was the scores that made everyone's eyes pop out. And and so we were sure it was going to be, you know, a huge hit. And then circumstantially, it wasn't, you know. Um, and uh, you know, can you know, ha had I known what what how it turned out, would I have acted differently? Had you know, would I have been able to have seen what was happening before it happened? And you know, do I think I do think about that? Yeah, because yeah, the, yeah, the you're proud of the children. movie. I you can't made. tell you which one yeah. I love the most and which one I hate the most. <laughs> do we have a, another one on this side? Do you see a hand up? There's one in the second row. Thanks. Sorry, I hate to be that guy, but I've actually got two shorter questions. Okay, if they're short, you're yes, allowed. They're short. The first question is just sort of what about China and how do you look at China as a market? Yeah. Yeah, go for that. Uh, um, I, I mean, it's I changed. think China is changing a lot as well. I mean, you know, China, I mean, it's interesting. China, so China used to be, well, they would allow, what was it, like 21? It was the quota. Yeah, yeah. Like 21 films Foreign, and people like... are battling for those spots. And we've only had like a few films that have ever been released there. And then, but they, you know, and the business that they do there is sometimes, you know, like you say like, oh my God, it, you know, it makes like a hundred million dollars there, you know, and then what, how does that trickle down? What does that, what does that money mean? And like how, you know, is, is it having like a cultural impact? And, you know, it's very hard to read what China is, uh, is means to a movie and China is closing itself off increasingly from American and, still and Western movies. recovering from the pandemic. Yeah, and still recovering from the pandemic. And, you know, yes, it has, like, like I think the second largest audience, uh, film audience in the world behind India. Um, but uh, um, it's hard to know what that means and also what compromises you need to make in order to show a film there. Good question. Next question. And then the second question was something about what you were saying earlier about sort of the responsibilities of a producer and director to keep making films. Because as of like a couple of days ago, you have Xavier Dolan, who's age 34, and he's already made five or six films, announcing that he's going to stop directing films simply because he's like sick and tired of putting in two years of effort for a film that nobody watches. He'll be back. He'll, I know, yeah. Soderbergh, cool. they always say that. Yeah, of course he'll but be yes, back. Yeah. But I guess what, the, what I'm asking is how do you keep that motivation when everything else seems so bleak and when you know maybe a passion project fails how do you think 
I've got to get back up on my feet. Perfect and keep question. Going. Well, I that's that's really, I didn't hear that about Xavier Dolan. Um, that's uh, that's dispiriting to hear. But you know, I, I'll tell you, things are bad. You know, right now. <laughs> Put that in the headline if we've things got press here. You know. Bregman said things, things are, are bad. bad. That's the takeaway. Um, uh, um, uh, but let me say a couple of things. One is there's never been a time in this business when people didn't say things have never been this bad. To me, when I started in this business in 1993 working as Ted Hope's assistant, he said to me, indie film is dead. In 1993, it hadn't even begun, you know, and it was, and he was like, it's over. And he wrote an article, you know, I think in 95, I think in like Filmmaker magazine or some what magazine saying, saying, uh, you know, that, that, that indie film is over, you know, and this was like, you know, we had yet to make 55 indie films that, you know, the changed the, the, changed the land, the cultural landscape. You know, so things are bad. Things have always been bad. The only consistent aspect of the film business is that everybody thinks it's never been worse and it's time to pack it up. <laughs> you know, and I, I would put money on Xavier Dolan coming back and making a movie. And are you a producer? So some, someone here should take that as a challenge to say, back. yeah, bring him back. Like say, okay, you know, bring it on, bring it on. So <laughs> you, you, you say you're not gonna make a movie, we're gonna make this movie. What movie do you wanna make? I'll make that movie. I'll find a way to make that movie. We'll, or I'll find a way for you to make this movie. Or we'll find some way to make that movie. You can't, you, you, you can't, like things are bad, but they've always been bad and there's always been a way to continue forward. Yeah, clap, <laughs> preach. Um, that movie. Yeah, we've got time for one more question. Who's got the highest hand? There's. Do you have any stress management <laughs> tricks or advice? That's <laughs> such a good question. <laughs> Practical and effective. Yes, I like it. I mean, it's a really good question. The, the it's because I think producers take on the film and become the film, and when there's problems in the film, they become uh, your problems. And they and you make if you know. I, I was telling Wendy that I have a friend who um, was having such a you know you know who basically was having such a problem such problems with this movie she was making that she said um, that she had briefly considered just like walking into a car, into a street, and getting hit by a car because that could take her out of the problems, you know? And she quit the business. She did not do that. She didn't do that, but Don't she quit that. the business. And when I asked her why, she told me that story, you know? Um, and I think the, I think, I think the more, you know, I think you have, the, the, these problems happen, and the, all these problems, you take them personally, and you, and they're, 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 they, they drive you mad, and they prevent you from sleeping, and it causes stress, and I think the, the, the way you have to think about them is, um, or the way that I think about them, you know, is, you know, it's not the problem, it's like, okay, how can I best that problem? How can I, okay, this is a challenge, just like with, with Xavier Dolan. It's like you, you're, you find, you, you, you take it as a challenge. It's just a fucking movie. It's not, you're not gonna, it's not gonna kill you, you know, and, and in the end, at the end, if you think of it as, you put it in perspective, one day this problem, this movie, this stress will be behind you, and you'll look back at it and say like, oh, I had that problem, and then I dealt with it, or it, or it collapsed the movie, or whatever that is, it's gonna, whatever's gonna happen, happens, you can fight it, you can find a way around it, you can think of it as like a challenge, and, uh, and then, one day it will be behind you and you'll be moving on to other things and you'll, you know, you'll be happy you didn't walk in front of a car and you'll be happy you didn't quit the business, you know, because there's other ways to, you know, keep it going. That and exercise, I think is very good. Are you a jogger? Yeah, I am a runner. Okay. Um, and, uh, and I find that that takes a lot um, of my anger out. Okay. Really quick, um, why do you think no one's buying movies right now? Because I know the market's really bad. 
because there aren't enough distributors. That's why there's not there's not enough distributors, especially in the U.S., which kind of you know push uh, motivates a lot of the other markets. There's only like a handful of distributors right now, and that means there's only a handful of slots, and that means those slots go to the kind of the pedigreed projects, and people aren't taking the risks that they used to take. You know, so I think the I think you know that's a problem. You know, and I think. If, if anyone wants to be a distributor, this is a good opening for that, you know, and, and especially to distribute in the U.S. There's not, there's only like, you know, there's under 10 distributors now that can pick up your movies, you know. Um, and there's some, some distributors have really, you know, innovative plans now, like Mubi, who I know is, 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 oh, is, here. I don't know if they're here, but they're, but they're, you know, they're at the festival, um, that, they, they, you know, they have like a totally new model. And it's really exciting for me to say, like, hey, let's tr let's try that model. Maybe that will work in the same way that it was exciting for me back in 2016 to say, hey, let's try that Netflix model. That seems like something that can work, you know. And so, you know, movie today will be Netflix tomorrow, and there'll be other, con you know, or maybe it may be Neon tomorrow, or A24, or Focus, or Searchlight, you know. And so, we need more distributors. Good question. Nice and short for you, anyway. <laughs> um, we have to wrap for time, but I just want to say, I mean, what an amazing guy you are. And I've just loved every second of hearing from you. I know the audience has. Um, we didn't even get the chance to show the Flora and Sun clip, but go see Flora and Sun, or when is that day? That is Apple? in the fall. In the fall? Yeah. Autumn, we say here, because we're fancy. In the autumn. Um, as we said, Eileen is out in December. Um, Claire's going to sell you a ticket on your way out. Um, you hurt my feeling on Sunday. You hurt my feelings on Sunday night as our closing night, and it's just wonderful. Um, Anthony, keep up the good fight. <laughs> Don't walk in front of the car. Um, keep rebuilding the shuttle. Uh, gosh, you've taught us so much. Thank you so much. A huge round of applause, please. Thank Anthony you. Anthony Bregman. Thanks. Thank you.